I'm JJ Arisha, Managing Director of Trenchant Ventures. I'm a member of Techos Angels, and you're watching Eye on Business. Welcome to Ion Business. I am Kevin McDonald, and with me tonight is Dave Burkus. Mr. Burkus is actually very well known in the market for investors, angel investors, and is also known as Mr. Trend. He's a very well known author, speaker, and we're really happy to have him here today. Thank you so much for coming, Dave. Um, I appreciate it. Sure, Kevin. Thanks. Now, Good to be here. Now, why don't you help me with a little bit, Mr. Trend? What's that about? Well, it was a couple of years ago when I had so many things that I do that nobody could quite put a, a collar around it, and uh, I hired somebody to try and figure that out. And the person said the one thing that people seem to call you is Mr. Trend. So now, so are we that. talking about trends in business in general, trends in technology? Um, what, what would that? Very definitely the trends in technology. Okay. Which is so let's I talk about some of the exciting things that are going on today. Give us a little bit, uh, if you can, of what you know about that. Well, I give a keynote that uh, is fairly popular, in fact, popular with corporations and business groups all around the world. Mm -hmm. And it is, meant, it is meant for investors, but also for entrepreneurs and people to figure out where the next trends in technology might be, because obviously that's where they want to fly with the prevailing winds. Mm -hmm. So there are 10 that I identify, and two of them, we kind of wrap the consumer trends into one and the medical trends into another, so there really are more than 10 trends that we do identify. But by far the biggest, and the one that's been the biggest of the 10 trends for the last decade, has been the hyper growth of the internet. Mm -hmm. It continues again. So now we have over six billion people in the world, and we have almost two billion people that have regular access to the internet. Now that's not too big a shock when you hear that, mm -hmm. until you hear that in the United States we have 383 million people, and of that we have 71% of them that have regular access to the internet. So that's fairly mature. And yes, we'll find a way to get to the outlying areas and have more people have those mm -hmm. access. But then think of what's happening in China. Out of the two, million, 2 billion people that have access to the internet, 858 million of them are in China. Wow. And that represents only 21% of the people in China. So the, the growth question is obvious. The answer then becomes kind of obvious, and that is the growth in the internet will continue to come from China, let alone from Asia. Now, I know that there's some pretty extreme restrictions on the Chinese. For example, they're not allowed to use Facebook. Um, do you think that, that they're going to have the same benefit culturally, um, the sort of globalization of the world that we benefited there from? There is it? the argument that there may be two internets. Okay. And that the internets are really being bifurcated by the governments, and it becomes a political device. Uh, however, there are always ways around that. And we found that many of the social networking sites have been able to get ways around that or find ways around that, as we found during the Egypt crisis, we mm -hmm. found in Libya, and other places where people can communicate outside of the ways the government can stop them from communicating. Mm -hmm. However, Baidu now is by far more popular than Google because Google decided that it didn't want to have those kinds of restrictions. The Chinese government was even more restrictive after that, be that fight began. And Baidu now has 80% of the search business in China, and Google's down to 19%. Now, do you think that's um, because they want to keep the business inside, or is it to control things like we've seen in, in the Middle East, where it seems like much of the unrest has been triggered by social networking? I mean, does the, it, is it the, the Communist Chinese wanting to keep that technology down in order to keep it safe? Or? It has nothing whatsoever to do with technology and everything to do with, you may remember from history, the revolution of rising expectations. Mm -hmm. And all the people now in China that are moving from the outlying areas into the cities are seeing and demanding middle class things. Right. And the government's having a very hard time at this point. And they want to resist the Americanization or the Westernization, I guess, of the people That's as much as they the can. That's part of the trend in that sense, too. Yeah. That's so, not a technology trend at all. So you're quite the author, and I've been a reader of your newsletter for, for quite some time. Um, you, you do. Uh, Berkus Technology Ventures, you were the former chair of the Tech Coast Angels, right. you're involved in the Trenchant Ventures organization. Um, 
What is it that you think, if you were to start today, of all the things you're doing and you were to recommend to somebody else, what would you say you would put most of your time into? That's a great question. I am an angel investor and have been since 1993. Uh, in 1990, I sold my hotel computer company uh, and at that point ran the company for them for three years, left the company in May of 1993 and began what was then unknown as far as its title. The title of angel investing was really unknown back then. Mm -hmm. So I wrote my first book that year, 1993, and I called it Resource Capitalism. Mm. And the whole theory was I was doing more than investing money in these tiny companies. Now that I had the money from selling my own, my object was to find other small entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs that needed help in their small companies. Mm -hmm. And so I would find them, invest money in them, and the theory went on, well, there's much more I can give. And that's what the book began to talk about. And the other things you can give are obviously how to reach and use time as a weapon. And I don't mean the kind of a weapon that you think of, but rather as a business weapon, mm -hmm. because time is your enemy. And it reducing time is. to market yeah. is obviously important. Now, that's one thing I know that the Internet has done, too, and, and the advancement of technologies. I mean, you used to have time as an individual to start an idea, kind of develop it in the garage, and then slowly grow into it. Today, if you blink, someone else has already run you over. Well, right. how, do you, how do you work through that? I mean, what do you suggest that, do people take more risks up front, or is it just a matter of bringing in more people to try to mature it more quickly? As I give, and here we go again, I give a workshop on this very subject. And the workshop okay. is called Extending the Runway. Extending yeah. the Runway, Building Better Boards, Building Better Companies. Mm -hmm. And I describe when we're talking about time, the fact that it is usually deliberate. When you're overwhelmed and you have so much that you just can't touch, because you have so much on your plate, that's not the kind of time that I'm worried about. I'm more worried about when you, as the boss, overcommit the resources that are the core of your company and destroy the company in the process, or at least damage it so badly that it needs to be rebooted. So it would be a misallocation of, of the valuable talent? Let me give you an example. Please. I gave it a name back in the 70s because it was happening to software vendors so much that those software vendors couldn't recover. Mm -hmm. And as I got into the software business myself in the days, I was able to pick up the pieces from a lot of those companies. But that term that I had developed, time bankruptcy, described exactly what was happening. They would commit, say, 80% of the, th of the work they had to do, never finishing that last 20%, but getting paid and needing to feed the fixed overhead of the company and going on to the second job mm -hmm. for whatever the reason. Maybe the company wasn't able to absorb all the training. Maybe the job actually wasn't finished. The software wasn't complete. Mm -hmm. And they would finish the second job, or at least 80% of it, and go on to the third. And the first, which was giving good recommendations, the boss of the first would call and say, it's time to finish the other 20%. But by this time, the money had been spent for the first two. You're beginning to get the feeling. Uh, yeah. By the time yeah. you hit job five or six, you're not making any money anymore at all because you're putting out fires to avoid lawsuits. And it's a quite different atmosphere within a company that's working from time bankrupt than it is from a company that's organized and being able to deliver a product on time with high quality. So let me ask if you can comment a little bit uh, on uh, sort of a macro picture with Microsoft because we've seen Google, of course, the explosion of Google as an industry. Um, they were a startup from a college Sure. You know, dorm, right? Sergio and Brown. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. But we've now seen Microsoft, and I, I've actually commented publicly that it seems like Microsoft's chasing windmills all the time. Instead of focusing on something that they can do well, they're trying to copy and do what everybody else is doing. They don't seem to be the innovators anymore. Depends on which part of Microsoft you're talking about. That's the easiest thing to say. But you've got to remember that they were the one that really developed the desktop. Mm -hmm. And they're the one that let us have a desktop. Right and a GUI that allowed us to teach people how to use computers in a much more easy, mm -hmm. friendly fashion than before. Mm -hmm. Well, today, Microsoft is making a lot of money in games. Right. They're not making much money in the operating system because Google's Android is free, and there are a lot of other challenging operating systems and have been, like Unix, sure. for years. And so it is a point now where Microsoft has to know where its next big number comes from. Uh, I talked to one of the chiefs at Microsoft right under Balmer, and I asked that question at one time. And the answer was, if it doesn't move our needle by $10 billion, it isn't worth it to us. Wow. Because Microsoft had gotten so big at that point that they had to buy some companies to be able to make any kind of a movement of their needle. Mm -hmm. And at this point, yes, the desktop business is threatened because here we are with all these new devices now running on new operating systems. Yes, the operating systems business is pretty much threatened as well. Yeah. Businesses aren't moving to Windows 7 quite as fast as Microsoft would like, even though it is faster by far than they moved to Vista. But their gaming business is improving right now. Other retail businesses have never done so well. And 
they have a business in the back office, which most people don't know about, that's doing almost $10 billion as well. So their general ledger and accounts payable and receivable software business, which they bought, they didn't build, right. is doing extremely well. Well, that's good to hear. So let's go back to what you're about, which is the, the, the germination of new opportunity and helping people start new businesses. Right. California, as, as I know it, um, is, does about, there's about 970,000 employees in technology, average salary of $106,000 a year, huge industry. But it seems to me that the state government um, is intent on pushing those people out of the state to the degree that they can. And I don't know if that's intentional or not, but there's discussion last year or the year before of service taxes. They tend to hit us with pretty hard environmental regulatory compliance issues. Do you see California being able to use technology to dig itself out of the situation we're in right now? Are well, they going to continue to chase people out? First thing to do is to apologize for the statement, Governor Brown. <laughs> or Governor Schwarzenegger before him, uh, California really thought that it had it all because we had Silicon Valley. Yeah. And I am a member of the Angel Capital Association, Tech Coast Angels is a member, and those of us who are active go back to the annual association meetings. Mm -hmm. And what we find, and as I speak and what I find as I travel, there are about seven or eight states that offer tax refunds or tax credits for people who invest in young technology companies. And they're obviously trying to bring these technology companies to their states. Some of these states are allowing 50% of the investment as a refund on their tax, wow. which means that people investing in tech companies are being rewarded unbelievably. California not only offers zero and never has, and my guess is probably never will, but it taxes the profits that come out of these technology profits, the capital gains, mm -hmm. at the same rate as ordinary income. Yeah, without any of the understanding of the weighting of the investment, the risk, the, the you know, the, it's it not the no only sense. state, but it's one of the only states that right. does this. And now, yet, I know Texas and Virginia, in fact, have made great strides uh, in the last few years. And as I understand it, Texas has less than a five percent unemployment rate. If you're speaking about who's drawing the technology out of yeah, California, yeah, aside from Nevada, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You can look to Kansas. Okay. Surprise. Well, that's a new one for uh -huh. me. I didn't know that. You can look at uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. There are states that offer these incentives now, not only special uh, business areas for these businesses, but also reductions of taxes for the investors right. that are really attractive. And yes, businesses are not moving into Silicon Valley or Southern California at the rate that we thought they would. So let's talk about it from the angel investor's perspective, why that matters, because for those that, that don't understand what angel investor is, this is the beginning. This is when you need that first few dollars, that, that just the startup capital. And these are the folks that take the big risk and help you get up off the ground. As an angel, why does it matter what the state, how the state treats the gain? Oh, well, let's talk in terms of the kind of angel that I am and that my group is, the Tech Coast Angels. First of all, there are classes of investors that are below the angel the friends and family investors. Mm -hmm. And these people will put money into a company almost regardless because it's a personality investment almost more than anything else. Right. When you professionalize that game and turn it into an investment for profit and you're attempting to find the best of all of those that come to you, it really becomes much more of a difficult opportunity right. for us to find good business, to find good businesses. And so Tech Coast Angels had almost 700 applicants last year. I think we funded 20. Wow. I'm not sure the numbers are exact, but you get the idea. The funnel mm -hmm. becomes very small in the end. And many times people who make the application really aren't qualified and they're easy to be able to define and to be able to tell, come back later. Right. But there are, of that 20, there probably were six times that many that were viable, good mm -hmm. business opportunities that were something that could have been funded. So if the state hits you for your return, basically you're saying, why would I invest money if you're going to turn around and take half of it uh, in the way that you would normal income. I mean, is that... Well, the federal government is very good to us, and, and you may know that the Obama administration had a uh, tax holiday on right. capital gains when invested from small businesses. There are some rules. It's called Rule 1202. 1202. And 1202 requires that you hold on to the investment for five years. Mm -hmm. It requires that the invested capital in the business be no more than, I believe it's $10 million. Beyond that, it's too big an investment. And there are a few other restrictions. It can't be in the finance industry, for example, or I think in farming, it has to be in technology mm -hmm. or related industries. But the profits from those investments, the people that make those investments, five years later, when they finally sell the investments and make their money, had been 50% exempt from federal income tax. And by the way, the state of California, too, 50% exempt from that high rate of income tax. 
and the federal government moved it up uh, in October to 100 complete exemption. And we thought it would go away on December 31st. Uh, the Obama administration has pushed it now, and it looks like it's going to be a semi-permanent, at least as we can tell, 100% exemption. Now, do you think with the circus act that's happening in Washington right now that, that, that the draconian cutting that's going to go on isn't going to, do you think that's going to negatively impact the R&D type and the type of investment you're talking about? Do you see that as negative? One of the gains that we get from going uh, to the Angel Capital Association meetings and talking to people from the SBA, for example, mm -hmm. and talking to other people from other states is to get the feeling that this administration is looking at and talking about small business in the right way. Yeah. And so I have uh, a little optimism here. Yeah, yeah actually, we've been on a couple of calls with folks, the representatives from the White House and uh, CompTIA mm -hmm. in particular, and I do believe that um, they are starting to get it, that, that small business means small business and not the classification of the SBA, for example, was a problem that they went, we think anyway, went too high and ended up leaving off the lower end of the, S of the small business class. And then, of course, now um, we're, we're trying to push for intellectual property being represented is an asset because mm -hmm. they're looking at the old model. If you don't have a widget to sell or a book like this to sell, they won't loan you money against it because there's nothing to, to take back as a... Well, remember, the SBA is enabling the banks. And right. although there are rules, the banks are the ones making those decisions. Yep. And so there is a chance that the banks themselves, who have been so cons which have been so conservative over all this time, are going to mm -hmm. begin to loosen now as the economy begins to lighten up. They do. So, so I'd really like to get into some of the cool technologies that, what, if you, yeah. I mean, you've been at this, you've done 70, I think, 70 investments in Coming close to 80, okay. since 1993. 80. Right. And uh, for those of you that know what an internal rate of return is, an IRR is the way you measure your money from the time you put it into a business to the time you take it out. And if it sits on the sidelines, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, make a negative number. You're right. just allowed to have nothing going on for a while. Right. So my IRR going back to 1981 is 97%. Wow. That's like doubling a penny every year. Yeah. And it's a very good number. Yeah. From the point when I began professionally investing in 1993, it's 23% per year. So I've been lucky, and that's part of the game here. And I've also picked some good winners. So what do you think was the coolest thing you invested in? I mean, if you had to look back and go, wow, that was just really cool. <laughs> there have been a number of really cool ones. Uh, let's talk about uh, Orange County for a good example, just for the location. Uh, back in 1998, I met a young entrepreneur that was designing web pages for a living, but really wanted to handle the gaming industry in a way that had never been handled before, by creating a lobby, allowing people to organize before getting into games as teams. Oh. And that was his idea, and he had eight employees working around here in uh, Orange County, and called me and asked for help organizing his company to be able to be the internet business he wanted to be. And I went to see him, was very enthused, began to help him free to organize, and helped him reincorporate the company as GameSpy in oh, January of exactly 1999. So I took 10% from my $100,000, he took 90% for his idea, and we built that company. And wow. although it is a story of the bubble, because we built it into a company that was worth half a billion dollars right. uh, after just a year and a half. That's amazing. We didn't sell it for anything like that because the not. bubble burst. Mm -hmm. But we created uh, one of Orange County's several largest internet businesses. And we did sell it. It ultimately became part of Fox Interactive. Uh, Rupert Murdoch bought it at the same time that he bought MySpace. Wow. And combined the two of them and it became Fox Interactive. So there's so a lot of people that are really worried about the future. And what is your view of the next few years for the United States? I'm very optimistic that the innovation that we're sensing right now, mm -hmm. and we talk about all these trends as, a, as kind of proof of this, that the innovation is going to be very positive in the influence it's going to have for our economy. However, we are kind of destroying the middle class in doing this, and that's yeah. something we have to talk about as a macro effect to the micro opportunity of being an innovator. We're creating lots of small businesses. Lots of big businesses continue to grow as well. Mm -hmm. The problem is the middle-sized businesses. There's a fact that is really interesting to the people I tell when I give these keynotes. You know, if only half of the small businesses in the United States each hired one new employee, we would have no unemployment in this country. So wouldn't it have been better then to have taken the stimulus money instead of throwing it at Raytheon and all these big companies and giving all the small businesses some money? I think the administration today is beginning to believe that. But remember, I mean, I it thought, wasn't in yeah. the place when the stimulus began. Yeah, it's phenomenal. 
yeah. mean, we, we looked at them we, as a technology company ourselves. I'm like, well, wait a minute. You give all the money to the big company, then they go out and find companies to actually deliver, deliver the work, and they pay them a much less of a margin. And now the big company gets bigger, and you know, it doesn't make any sense. So I um, want to make sure we talk a little bit. This is Burkonomics Lessons for a Lifetime in 140 Characters or Less. Dave <laughs> Burkus. This is one of Dave's book. Mm -hmm. And the other one here is Extending the Runway, Leadership Strategies, Venture Capitalists, and Executives of Funded Companies. Um, I recommend that if you'd like something to read, good stuff. Can you tell me a little bit about these so that sure. people know what they're looking for? Thanks for the pitch. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, my website is berkus.com, B-E-R-K-U-S.com. And berkus.com is where you find the books, and it'll lead you to berkonomics.com. And Berkonomics is where all of these are published as weekly missives so that you have a chance to subscribe to them weekly or read them through an RSS feed or look at them yourself. But either way, it's an opportunity for you to get little tiny niches of information. That's why I call them 140 characters or less, emulating the tweet. Mm -hmm. And so some of these things, uh, just for example, uh, to talk about find the bottleneck as what a business person should do to be able to enable a business and make it more efficient, just right. as one example among the 101 in that particular book. So we describe how to find the bottleneck in a business and what impact, negative before and positive after, cleaning up that bottleneck. So uh, the books are quite different. Extending the Runway talks about, as we began to, how to build a business based upon having a great board and doing the five classes of things right. I talked about money and time. We never talked about the other three, but the idea is there are ways in which you can leverage great resources from your investors. Well, I think I'd like to have you come back and talk about those other three, and let's discuss with 140 characters or less. Explain <laughs> that part of the title, if you would. I have found that uh, not just my readers, but the average reader has a pretty strange attention span. And Twitter six, would explain that, <laughs> wouldn't it? Right? 600 words is about it, Right. The size of a short magazine article. So taking that idea, what I did was to write, in essence, 101 short magazine articles. So people could read this on the airplane. They could read pieces of it whenever they wanted to. Right. And it is the life of a business, or the life of creating a business, from the very beginning through the liquidity event, which is the very end when you sell your business. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming in today. Sure. It has been an, an, a very interesting conversation, and I hope that, if you, that we'll, you know, you'll agree to come back and talk to us again. Happy to, Kevin, anytime. Thank you so much. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you've been watching Eye on Business, and with us today was Dave Burkus. Hi, my name is Joey Flores. I'm the co-founder of EarBits.com, and you're watching Eye on Business. Welcome to Eye on Business. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with me today is Dave Burkus. Dave is actually a world-renowned angel investor. He was with us before, and we wanted to continue the conversation, so I'm going to get right into it. Dave, thanks for coming back. I appreciate Great, it. Great, Kevin. Glad to do it. Now, we started to get into some of the reasons why you are called Mr. Trend, and you were having a conversation about the fact that there seems to be two bifurcated internets, one in China or one in the Asian market, mm -hmm. and one in the rest of the market, and uh, you wanted to make a point about the languages. Can you tell me about that? We have so many things happening in the internet world today that are going to change the way in which we look at those companies we're trying to get to and those social networks we're trying to stay within that uh, this is a major trend. So first of all, the internet today is about 200 million people out of the six billion plus that are in this world. Mm -hmm. So a little less than a third of the people in the, uh, in the world now have regular access to the internet. Right. Seventy-three percent of those in the United States have regular access. Only 21% of those in China have regular access. So if you look a little further, and you know that uh, the number of people, 2 billion, that have access to the internet right now is a major number, 20 million new people join the internet every single week. All kinds of ramifications of that. And so let's talk about some of those ramifications. Sure. One of those is we're running out of addresses. Yep. So ICANN, the people that give out the addresses, ran out of addresses on December 31st of the year 2010. They, in turn, give addresses out to the ISPs, and the ISPs have not yet run out and probably won't until the end of 2012. Right. When that happens, we will have had the same thing as the year 2000 crisis. People who try and get new internet addresses, and I'll speak about that in a few seconds, this is an important trend in itself, are not going to be able to unless they get the new 128-bit internet accesses 
addresses that will not be accessed by all the old equipment that's out in the internet today. Now this is the move to IPv6? IPv6. Yeah. Okay. So IPv6 is important because today there are two billion devices, not people, that access the internet. And we joke about saying a refrigerator tells you whether you have milk that is sour, but it is true that these devices, whether they're cell phones or other kinds of fixed devices that report their status, two billion, are expected to be three billion by the end of the year 2012. Wow. Another billion devices is an unbelievable addition and overload in the internet, not even talking about people. No, and the, and the address, for those that don't may not know, is it, there's an IP number, or it's like a home address just like your house. And there's a number with digits, and just like zip codes and area codes, you run out of extensions. And so effectively, you're saying that the internet is growing so fast that in 2012, we're going to be done with our current number structure. So that's one of the unfortunate trends that will be fixed. IPv6 is going to be turned on and tested in the next month. Uh, Vincent Cerf, one of the original inventors of the internet, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be in charge. Google, he works at Google now as their chief innovator is going to be in charge of a one-day test of IPv6. And as they begin to find the problems with it, and in the year 2000, we had a few problems from some things, yeah. they will begin to build more and more of an infrastructure on IPv6. When you buy new devices, such as new routers, you'll have IPv6 built into it. So it's not as if we all have to go out and buy new equipment. Right. The problem isn't on our side, on the router side. It's on the server side. Yep. All these giant servers all over the world have to be able to route through their routers, which are the ones that need the changes. And the large data centers and the places that have all right. built around this functioning set of numbers. So that's going to happen. But now you have to worry about the people who take a new address aren't going to be able to reach the desktops of the people who only have the old address equipment because their ISPs haven't been able to get to the new addresses yet. The people with the old addresses may not be able to broadcast their internet information to the new address people unless they have dual addresses. And so that's exactly what People are working on right now. It'd be Google interesting addresses. if they can come up with some sort of a translation that would do a conversion or. or it's know, not for us to do. Know, it's yeah. all being done that really maintain the table. Right. But, uh, make when we talk about a URL or a URL, when you have an, an address like Berkus.com in my case. Yep. Uh, when I have Berkus.com, I don't think that it really is a series of four numbers. Right. And some days will be a series of six numbers. That's going to happen, but it won't be anything that I'll see. Right. And it is that change that is going to be a sea change, but it's going to have to happen, and it will have to happen by the end of 2012, or all these new, one billion new devices are going to have nobody to speak to. So let me ask you about the, the, the recent jump into the fray, uh, the secondary attempt by the um, FCC to take control of the Internet, um, and through what they call neutral relationships. And they're, I'd like to know... Do you, for one, do you think the courts are going to reverse it? I'm of the opinion they ultimately will, or Congress will. Um, secondly, do you think that there's danger in having them getting involved in the, regula the regulation of the free Internet? So there's been a lot of rumor lately about whether or not four people really do have the key to the Internet, right. and whether or not we're all going to have open access forever. Right. And there really is the question about who owns the Internet, and the answer is nobody does. Mm -hmm. And so the governments, and this is where we began our conversation, the government of China has actually, for the first time, imposed restrictions on who can get in and who can get out when speaking of information on the Internet. Right. That's going to continue to some degree even though net neutrality is the term you were looking for, yeah. is the term that we all who are the users of the Internet would like to see everybody subscribe to. Net neutrality says basically that nobody will try and interfere with free access to the Internet, free legal access to the yeah. Internet. Yeah, I was trying to stay away from the legal term. I actually was a lobbyist for pro-net neutrality. So oh, oh, I was very okay, well, familiar. I spent a lot of time in Washington, <laughs> D.C. on the issue. And I, I'm concerned, um, though, that... Um, it may take too long for the courts or Congress to act and that they may end up sticking their nose in too, into places that may cause us issues. It's always a risk, and it always is. What was government intended to do and what is government doing? Right. And so there's a question for another show sometime in the future. <laughs> That's a very good point. But when yeah. we speak about China, which is really where this is now playing out in the theater, China has restricted access in and out to areas of the Internet that they choose to show to their people. Yeah. It's a point in time when governments have actually begun to say it's, for them, it's government policy that is affected by technology. And that's interesting. 
to me as a technologist, sure. as a futurist. Sure. Well, they're doing the same thing in Europe. I mean, I know that, for example, it's illegal to have not Nazi propaganda in Germany, for mm -hmm. example, and there are, they don't have the same free speech that we have here, but as a result, um, they also don't have some of the problems with some of the more extreme pornography and the things that happen in the United States because mm -hmm. of that open all, overall open protection. Um, as uh, you have ten trends, let's go to a couple more of them. Why don't you tell me a, a little bit more about your trends? Sure. First of all, let me tell you about the trend that was and that is not right now, and that is clean tech. Okay. Doing well by doing good is something we all wanted to subscribe to. Clean tech means, to me at least, investments in technology that would allow for clean use of the environment. Right. And when the Obama uh, campaign promised fifty billion dollars to go into clean tech if Obama were elected. Actually, only eight a billion has gone in at this point from the government. But venture capitalists hearing that piled on and yeah. invested thirty-eight billion dollars of their money into these clean tech businesses. Whether we're talking about more efficient solar panels or wind farms or other forms such as batteries that are twice as long in life, right. all of those kinds of technologies, these companies needed more money than the venture capitalists gave, expecting to have it come from the government. Yep. The reason why the it's no promise. longer a trend, yeah. exactly. Yep. It's not a trend for a while at least, because we're in what we'll call the valley of death. These companies can't get their funding, mm -hmm. they need more to make it, and yet we all need these companies to be successful. So let's go to that point then with, the, again, back to the circus of Washington, D.C. right now. I mean, we, I understand austerity. I do believe we way overreached on some of the things that, that, that the government was you know, committing to on the non-discretionary funds. Um, but at the same time, if we pull back to the degree that there's no new research coming out of the government, I think that's insanity. Some of the best things that have ever happened have come out of government-funded R&D and How can I NASA, disagree? And, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, how do you convince people that are, that are, frankly, I think, a little less sophisticated, and that's why they're making the decisions they're making? How do, how do we convince them that if you pull back, you're actually going to reverse the very innovation that is going to pull us out of this mess. So we talked for a few moments about clean tech. Let me tell you what I say to people in my workshops. Okay. Water flows downhill. Right. Now substitute the word money for water. As it becomes inexpensive enough for people to want to do it, then it doesn't take a government, it doesn't take outside investment other than to find the place where the money is being made to make this a successful business. Okay. So as things become cheaper, people will adopt. Speak now of hybrids. Talk about electric cars only. Right now, the hybrid is not worth the extra $4,000 to most people right. because the payback is four or five years and people don't see the payback. Yeah, unless I got the carpool lane, I can't see why I would want one. So. Okay, well, Lincoln has just now released a, I uh, forgot the model number, LMX, MPX, whatever their model numbers are, where a hybrid is the same price exactly as their V8. Now, for the first time, now it's a more expensive car, yep. people will have a choice at no extra cost. This is the first year. It'll be interesting to see what happens. It's one great example of whether or not people then let their dollar kind of lead them. So do you think the cutbacks, though, are going, so it sounds to me like you're saying that we've got, you know, a jet plane of opportunity that's basically stalling because of the fact that we didn't get the committed funds. In clean tech, that's right, and that's why I dropped it from the 10 trends. So what's coming next, then? Now taking the number two trend away from clean tech is the uh, rapid growth of social networking. Okay. Because what used to be the largest use of the Internet, porn, Yep. is now insignificant, right. which is something to celebrate. But what has become the largest use of the Internet now is social networking, which is wonderful because it's two-way communication. Yes. And it's replaced a lot of the kinds of communication we had had before with more efficient communication. You know, most of us at first laughed at the tweets when we said, I'm sitting down to dinner or I love the sunset. There are a few of those left, but now we're using those kinds of marketing mediums for great messages to yeah. help companies to, uh, as you saw in Egypt and Libya and other places, to help individuals in need, to uh, gather people together. Yeah. These are social networking at, uh, uses at their best. Well, and from the business side, I mean, I, I got a weird announcement. I got an email from LinkedIn recently telling me that I was one of the first 200,000 to ever sign and up for I LinkedIn. And I did, too. And I was proud of too. that. So I was, too. Had no idea what I was doing. It, but um, so... Do you think social networking, let me ask you another question about that, because as a writer, I actually do write for several magazines as well as do this show, and Good. I love free media. However, I do have some serious concerns about the fundamental lack of, of veracity of what's being said on the Internet. There's so much um, untruth, and it's so hard now to know 
who to believe. You're taking me into the subject of are we going to be able to find journalists to replace the failing newspapers? Right. And how are we going to find the good ones versus the bad ones? And will we pay those people? Exactly. It's a long, long story in that one. And it's one of those unintended consequences of having so much access to the internet. Right. When I talked about uh, 20, 20 million new people every year, join, or every week joining mm -hmm. the internet, mm -hmm. one of those unintended consequences is there is no more old media. Right. Craigslist destroyed the kind of advertising that supported the newspapers, yeah. and Craigslist was free. Yeah. And so now journalists are finding that, uh, I think with micro-funding, which is one of the portions of a new trend, not a trend in itself, we will begin to pay small amounts of money for things we want to see. We'll follow news stories, we'll follow journalists we trust, mm -hmm. and it will be crowdsourcing the right journalists for the right stories at the right time. And there will be a method of collecting money to let them at least have a great wage for doing what they're doing if they write well. It's, it's a new world out there. No, it certainly is. It's very interesting. So uh, of the other left trends, which ones do you believe are going to have the biggest impact on the, f the, the, the coming generations? The one that I used to call the office in my pocket that long since has become mobile, anything mobile. In fact, almost all computing at this point now is mobile to a degree where mobile is overtaken fixed in every way you look. Right. The number of desktop units sold now is pale by comparison to the number of mobile units sold, for example. Mm -hmm. The equivalent of uh, Facebook in Japan is Mixi, or Mixi, excuse me, M-I-X-I. -I. Right. And Mixi has a great market share in Japan, and it's interesting to look back and find over the last four years that the desktop at one time had 70% of all the users accessing that social network, kind of like Facebook. Right. And now 86% of all the people accessing Mixi are accessing it with their mobile devices, their smartphones. Wow. It's that, a different that world that way, That is pretty amazing. I, I wish I wasn't so blind, because I, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to get an iPad or something, because I can't read my phone anymore. Um, when the couple of minutes we have left, um, you know, when I was a kid, you, if you were trying to get educated, you had to go to the library and hope that that one paragraph in the encyclopedia was there for your report uh, or whatever yes. it is. And I have to say that of all the things that the internet and social networking and all these things have done is that, that the broad of the envelope of information available to my children. But now what about the digital divide? How do we deal with as a society the fact that we are actually, we've always had a have been have nots but we're seeing an extremely rapidly growing division between those where the have-nots don't have a computer. My kids deal with it at their schools now. They, they go home, they're supposed to print, they use Word, they use, you know. Well, if you don't have it, you actually get downgraded in your class. I understand. Um, you know, so is there, is there any model in this investment community or something that we could find a way to get a community model that isn't government paid for? I mean, is there anybody that's really tried to consider how to close this divide and make a financial model that works. Great examples of that. Uh, in India, I can't remember the name of the company now, has a very cheap $100 portable computer for kids. Mm -hmm. There's a $200 portable computer now that Acer has had for years. It's getting down to the point now where schools can actually give computers rather than textbooks and save money over time. Wow. And I think that will be a trend that we'll see over time, especially with tablet computing taking over at this point. Think of every kid having a tablet, and the tablet having a separate keyboard if that was necessary for right. an input device. And allowing those kids, therefore, to not have to take home this wheel full of backpacked books, but rather just a tablet. Which actually causes injuries. In fact, my my, uh, my kids, I mean, their book bag was probably in the, in the 30 pound range. It was ridiculous. So, Well, you know mm -hmm. what? Once again, thank you so much for coming in. It's always a great we to have just you. just touched the surface. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, and I think we'll continue this conversation. You've been watching Eye on Business. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us tonight was Mr. Dave Burkus. Thanks for watching. I'm Dave Burkus, and it's a pleasure to be on Eye on Business and talk about the trends in technology. One of the things that I think is both an avocation and a vocation for me as I give keynote addresses and write about them. If you're interested in some of these, it's interesting to go to my website, and I have a free email for you every Tuesday morning at 8.30. The website is berkus.com, B-E-R-K-U-S.com. And you'll find my books there as well. And if you're in a business as a small business person, you might be interested in looking at those books as well. I'm happy to be on IN Business and look forward to seeing you again. Hi, I'm Justin Palmer with WebSleb.com, and you are watching ION Business. 
Good evening, I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Ion Business. And with me this evening is Joey Flores. Joey Flores is the CEO of Earbits, and we'll let Joey tell us what Earbits is all about. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So um, let's start with the fact that you're quite a quite a new business. Um, first of all, when did you start Earbits? A year and a half ago, last January. Last January. Mm -hmm. So for those that uh, that are watching the show, what is Earbits about? Uh, Earbits is basically a uh, online radio platform similar to Pandora, but instead of trying to sell commercials for McDonald's or Lexus, we try to sell the actual music, the music products related with that particular artist. So if they want to promote a live performance that's coming up or t-shirts or a contest or anything, um, we basically are, are doing those things through an engaging radio platform. So for, for those that don't know what Pandora is, why don't you explain what's the platform? This is an internet-based radio or mm -hmm. is it, what, what is it exactly? So basically you can turn on a channel, it's uh, streaming music, it's what they call personalized radio, which means that you get your own stream, so if you don't like what you hear, you can skip to the next song. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you're not listening to the same song as anybody else necessarily. So you're competing with some, some big boys out there. What, what uh, makes you think you can win in this game? Uh, I think we have a better business model. Um, for the most part, uh, a lot of the other companies, their business model really kind of tugs them in different directions. So they're always trying to please sponsors. And when you try to please sponsors, you're typically not pleasing your users. In our case, because we, our sponsors are the bands, Mm -hmm. um, everything about the radio experience is about connecting the consumer with the artist, making this uh, connection more rich. Right. Um, you know, instead of having an ad, we might have we'll have what we consider an ad, but it's an ad for that band's show while that song's playing. It's just more relevant, and people like it better. So I I see that you've gotten some recognition. Um, and well, tell me a little bit about how you've been recognized, and then I'd like to get into how you're sustaining yourselves. So we, we won a pitch competition last year for the TCVN. Um, we then got later accepted into the Y Combinator uh, funding program, which is a sort of, a, sort of an incubator um, in the Silicon Valley. Okay. So um, we went up there for that program, and uh, during that program, we redesigned our website, relaunched, and got a write-up in TechCrunch, TechCrunch Japan, um, and since then have gotten coverage in a couple of other places too. Now that's a Silicon Valley accelerator, isn't it? I mm -hmm. mean, it's kind of like a, a good education program. You get to go through the, the mill of learning of how to run a business. Yeah, it's it's more about um, focusing on your product, uh, introducing you to to helpful people. Uh, mentorship and stuff like that. Um, the mentorship side, it's like you can take as little or as much as you want. So you can meet with the found, you know, the, the people who run the program whenever you want. Paul Graham, Paul Bukite, um, whenever you want, and then uh, ask them for guidance. They will connect you with people that they think can also help. And then there's a whole alumni network, of people who've done it before, which typically they'll be very helpful to the new people. Um, and now I'm helping people who are going through this next time, things right, like that. Right. So what's the financial model? How do you how do you see it as as you know where are you going to make your money and currently how are you sustaining the business? So we raised uh, some money before the program, during and after. Um, so we were funded by some good people. Um, and then uh, in terms of the business model, we will basically sell airtime packages to bands, venues, labels, anybody who wants to use music as an advertisement for a, a very relevant product or, or merchandise. So um, for example, um, if a venue wants to buy $1,000 worth of airtime and we'll play whatever bands are coming to their venue to promote the shows, um, we would do that. If a label wants to buy you know, airtime for a new single by a band to try to develop pre-orders for their upcoming album, they could do that. Or the band could buy it just to build up their email list, whatever they so want. So it should be a good way for an indie group if they have a little bit of funding to actually get some recognition then too, huh? Yeah. I mean, and you can start with like 10 bucks if you want. Uh, if you want to spend 2,000, you could do that too. That's the thing, it it's, should be very scalable, similar to like Google AdWords, whereas right now, hiring a publicist would be no less than $500 and there's no guaranteed results. So I got the sense that, that uh, Earbits is a little bit more of the edgy or the innovative music too. Is there a truth to that statement? Or? Um, by nature, we're not working with the major record labels yet, so um, most of the music you hear won't be the exact same stuff you hear on the radio, but we do focus on really high quality stuff. Everyone has to be pre-approved, um, but it will tend to be a little bit more on the independent side for now. So you won't have the, the howling banjo with the, the dog in the background? No. Unless the, unless <laughs> no. the population thinks right. that's music, right? Yeah, exactly, if it blows up on YouTube. Now, do you see that as part of your edge or your or your 
you know, your future is, is remaining away from the big labels? Or do you, would you like to actually have the big labels in play? Do you think that would negatively impact your, you know, your impression to the young people that watch it or the folks that are your viewers, your listeners? Um, I think that there will, we, we can set it up both ways. I mean, really what we want to do is have as many channels as we can to please the listener and give them what they want. So if somebody wants more independent, we can, you know, have a greater amount of discovery in their channel right. um, and play more independent music. Um, we're certainly not opposed to working with big mainstream artists, and we have a lot of really good artists that people do know. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, right now it, we, it tends to be independent for business reasons. Um, in the future, hopefully we'll have the choice of, you know, working with whoever we want. So what are the biggest barriers to actually getting with the bigger labels or the bigger players? I mean, is it, is it just proving that you're real or, I mean, what do you think are the real barriers for you in the future? Um, I think there's a perception issue that we have to solve. Um, the industry fought very hard to, to get artists paid for being on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, and we're now saying that, you know, we think we can do something that's sustainable for you, that builds a long-term business for your band or your, or, or, or you know, yourself as an artist. Um, and we're going to charge you, but we're going to give you the ability to like monetize it and and you know uh, develop your fan base and mm -hmm. and actually turn it into you know sales of, of items and things like that. And and I mean, basically, if you have like an ad-supported model, what happens is you might get a check at the end of the month but if they decide to stop playing your music the revenue stream stops yep. um, if we build up you know 5,000 people on your mailing list a bunch of people on your Facebook fan page sell some albums and really build a, a fan base for you and that those assets become yours right. um, you can continue to make money off of them in the future so I see that there's a social networking component you said that the assets become yours is, is there an ownership on your part of their their brand image while they're in your environment, or is it for theirs from the beginning, or is this just a vehicle to help them grow that brand? Yeah, so we, we don't own anything. They can stop using us whenever they want. They can take their music down whenever they want. Um, we, for example, um, on a lot of websites, it'll have like a like button for Facebook, and when you like it, you're liking that page or that piece of content on that site. Right. We actually took the artist's like button from their page and embedded it into ours. So when you like them on our website, you're actually becoming a fan of them on Facebook, and they can now communicate with you. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Is the user notified of that? Um, no, I guess technically we don't tell them that they're liking. The, they know that they're liking the artist. Right. They probably just don't know, know whether it's our site or the or the actual band reference. Website. Right. Yeah. Right. So what have, what have been some of your best successes? I mean, you're a startup. You're a year and a half out, and and having been in that position myself, you know, it can be some turbulent times. For those that are watching the show, what's been your your best success and what's been your biggest challenge? Um, I think the biggest impact of the business was being accepted into the Y Combinator program. We got access to people that we would have had a really tough time getting it otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of success, we now have 110 record labels on board, which people said a year ago was never going to happen. So, um, right on. you know, yeah, pretty excited about that. Um, in terms of the challenges and barriers, I think we need to build a bigger audience, and we're doing that right now through some pretty interesting partnerships. Yeah, that's great. So if, if you've thought about approaching some of the, I don't know, I don't want to call them the B actor types, but, you know, the, the groups that are still popular amongst maybe the older crowd or a little bit more on the fringes and bringing them in and bringing that much closer, are you working towards, do you have an outreach or, or, or um, recruiting arm? How does that all work? Yeah, so we have four people in the music department who uh, have dual functions. They go out and try to secure labels. And then when the music comes in, each of them is an expert in a particular genre or set of genres, and they classify all the music into the channels it's supposed to go into. Okay. Um, so they do a lot of our outreach. You know, um, as we grow and as like people become more aware, now we get submissions every day from from bands that want to work with us. Um, so it's going viral for you, is what it's doing. Yeah, I mean, That's the bigger great. our audience gets, the more people hear about us. The more bands we get, the more bands we get, the more audience grows. It's it, mm -hmm. it's very difficult at the beginning when you have neither of them, oh, yeah. um, but as you as you sort of build the both sides of the chicken and egg, it, it gets easier. So are you guys primarily American based? Are you seeing an international component to the business? Um, how are you doing in in the worldwide expansion because it's the World Wide Web for a reason. Yeah, uh, we have international traffic. I'd say it's like 10%. Um, 
Uh, we focus here mostly because it's, it's just easier for us. Uh, but I, I don't see any reason why we won't be working, mm -hmm. you know, internationally in the future. It gets a little more complicated in terms of licensing, but uh, because we're working directly with the rights holders, it's much easier than trying to rely on the government's compulsory licenses to use music. Right. So you're um, that, that actually brings up a good point. Are you working with ASCAP mm -hmm. artists? So we we're registered with ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, which okay. are all of the performing yeah. rights groups yeah. here. Mm -hmm. So so you are playing the the industry game in the way that you're not going to find yourself in trouble like some of the others did in the future. Yes, we um, we technically have uh, some royalty waivers because we're not selling ads or subscriptions, and we don't make any money unless the band buys airtime from us. So it doesn't really make sense to pay them a royalty when they're not when when we're not making money off of, of their content right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we license everything directly. Everyone signs our online terms and conditions just like you would if you were setting up a MySpace page. Okay. Well, being a young man and starting a business, um, what, how, did, how did you get here? I mean, what brought you from, from uh, not doing this to where you are today? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I started in the Internet like 13 years ago and uh, at some point became the director of business development for an ad network. Okay. And um, did that for five years. The company got acquired by Experian. Um, the co-founders left. I basically took over management of the company, grew it for a couple of years inside the Experian umbrella, and left there, went to another company, but at some point uh, just wasn't really thrilled about the types of products that we promoted. I mean, it was like mortgage leads and, you know, stuff that it's just I'm not passionate about at all. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and at the, during that time, my buddy and I started a band. And... Uh, I was going from managing like millions of dollars in ads to like passing out flyers at night and like <laughs> going like, this why is am crazy. I doing this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. How can we do what you do in music? And so we tried to like think of how do we apply like an ad network approach to marketing music. And the problem is that, you know, text ads and visual ads don't really convey what music sounds like. And so you don't yeah. care to click on something because you don't know what you're going to yeah. get. Yeah, so, unless you could do some sort of a teaser, which I'm sure somebody's eventually going to come up right, with. Right. I mean, if you had, like, the ability to stream a little bit of the track in the ad, yeah. you might be able to qualify a user that way. But until then... That's my idea if anybody wants to do it. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, um, <laughs> so uh, we were in the car, and he was asking, how can we do this? And I, I just said, you know, like, well, we're just kicking around ideas. He goes, you know, they have to hear the music. It has to be... They have to hear it. And we just sort of said, well, what if we turned radio into an ad network and mm -hmm. you could just buy impressions and we would help you monetize it and send traffic to your landing page. Basically, we really feel like this is a, an ad network approach to music marketing. Um, it's a little like Google AdWords-ish. You will be able to bid on airtime. You'll be able to buy $10 or 1000 Great, great. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell the audience, if you can, how they can find out about more about you and... and um Tell them whatever you like. Camera's on my left. Sure. So uh, you can go to earbits.com. It's E-A-R-B-I-T-S. Um, there's 70 channels to choose from, and uh, you can always reach us at listen at earbits.com. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks and, a lot. And, uh, you know, I wish you the best of luck with your program. Thank you. My name's Kevin McDonald. You're watching Ion Business, and with me today was Joey Flores with Earbits.